Hello and welcome to the Ocean Impact Podcast, where our guest today is Madison Stewart, also known as Shark Girl. Now this is an incredible podcast. I was literally on the edge of my seat and listening intently to every word that Maddie said. I find Maddie so inspiring. Those scenes in the documentary Blue where Maddie is walking through a notorious shark market in Lombok and witnessing these creatures in such a horrid state, creatures that she loves so dearly. You'd imagine that would be the kind of circumstances that would lead Maddie to never want to go back to that shark market again. But then Maddie isn't like every other girl. In fact, she has gone back to the same community and instigated a sustainable tourism project to employ shark fishermen in new activities that take them away from that practice. It's called Project Hear You, and we talk all about it in the podcast today in amongst a huge and awesome range of other stories that Maddie shares. I honestly think that Maddie is someone we all need to look to, to listen to, and to support. She is making a huge ocean impact every single day. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Thanks for tuning in. Very excited to have on the podcast today, Madison Stewart, a.k.a. Maddie or Pip to her friends, a.k.a. Shark Girl, incredible <laughs> filmmaker, shark conservationist, activist. How are you going, Maddie? I'm good, Tim. How are you? I'm really good. Really thrilled to be able to spend a bit of time exploring your world on the Ocean Impact podcast. Uh, we are going to be talking a lot about sharks and everything you've been doing to help conserve them. But um, let's just start with a little bit of a pulse check on, on how you're going at the moment, because I'm imagining your world has changed quite a little bit due to the COVID-19 crisis. Yeah, absolutely. I'm meant to be in China right now. So it was definitely a massive change. Um, but it's been quite a nice welcomed break, actually. And I think the time has definitely not been wasted. And we've just been getting ready to hit it hard when the world goes back to normal. Tell me about China. What were you hoping to be doing in, in China at this point in time? So I'm working on a film to follow a film that I did recently, just a small film that I did where I joined uh, fishermen in Indonesia for a two-week fishing trip at sea, uh, fishing sharks, and I was hoping to film the second half of that. So all the sharks that we caught and all the fins that were taken off those sharks, I want to follow them all the way through the trade to the market where they end up in Hong Kong. Great. I think we'll be talking a lot about the project that you're doing in Indonesia at the moment, which is just such a captivating and important project. But Let's, um, for those people that don't know uh, a lot about you, which are probably very few people, but let's, um, let's start at the beginning and explain a little bit about why sharks, why uh, ocean conservation and, you know, where it all stemmed from for you. Yeah, so I've loved sharks since I was a little kid. I grew up having a lot of involvement in the ocean thanks to my parents and I never wanted to be a conservationist. I always just loved diving and loved documentaries I wanted to make documentaries and travel the world and do cool stuff and it wasn't until I was about 14 years old that I began to actually see the dark side of things in happening in the ocean I began witnessing declines of shark species that I grew up diving with and I kind of got inspired back then to maybe do something about it I had this mentality that everybody knew what was happening to the ocean and they just didn't care but it was with age that I realized that a lot of people actually didn't know. And then once it was exposed, they began to care. So I'd say I got involved in conservation around 14 years old. And it's taken a really, really long, strenuous time to get anywhere with it, as it does. You never just like jump in and succeed right away. So that's been my background. And then in recent years, my roles in conservation kind of turned into being involved in documentary films and doing all different kinds of projects around the world, uh, basically just kind of winging it and just seeing where it takes me and just going out there and tackling little issues and big issues and individuals and all sorts of things. And I've been lucky enough to have a lot of involvement in a really few cool projects. When a lot of these videos that you've made over the years or been involved with are available for people to watch online and 
you can really see this journey that you've gone on. How would you say you've changed from that young uh, activist communicator to where you are now? Like, what's what's changed during that arc of your of your journey? I think a few major things have changed. I think um, one of them's definitely my approach to situations. Uh, like kind of utilizing and working with my enemies has been a huge change in what I do. Um, another one has been a more objective view on things. And I've started to focus in recent years more about how, I guess more just, just um, buying into the reality that sharks are dangerous and focusing on that as opposed to just trying to make conservation a, a greenwashed situation of where sharks can be treated like dolphins so it's been really interesting doing that realizing that sharks are dangerous animals and kind of having that mentality as we move forward so that we can include everybody in conservation the people that do damage to sharks and the people that can potentially be damaged by sharks so that's been a really interesting development especially living here in Australia and a necessary one Um, and I think just the development of my filmmaking as well and the way that I approach how to bring people in and get people involved in issues has really grown a lot since I was young, just based on what I've learned and what I've seen with the public reacting with what we do. Let's talk a bit about that idea of confronting your enemies. Um, When did that first stand out as a strategy that you would either need to take or that you just thought, I'll try this approach? Yeah. Um, It's a funny story, actually. I was in the very first time I ever did it. I was in Miami and I was heading to Mexico for a shoot and the shoot got canceled because the fishermen got spooked and didn't know who we were. So they didn't want to work with us, Um, which happens quite a lot. Obviously, when you try go in to some situations and you don't hide who you are or what you're doing often people don't want to be on camera. So I then had a layover in Miami and I had a few days of nothing to do. And Miami is not the the most wonderful place for someone like myself. Um, so I was really bored. And I remember looking at this shark hunter called Mark the Shark and just seeing him online everywhere. And then I realized, hey, he's based in Miami. I've got a few days. Why don't I actually utilize this time that I have here? So I sent Mark an email, a very blunt, straightforward email because I think a part of me really didn't want to talk to him. So I thought I would just approach it differently. And I remember specifically at the time being super disheartened by fellow conservationists being very um, competitive and kind of really nasty to me as a young person in conservation. So I just had this mentality, you know what, like, screw it. I'm not even getting along with people that are doing what I'm doing. So I may as well just try to get along with everybody. So I sent Mark an email being like, hey, buddy, I'm Australian. This is what I do. I don't like what you do. How about you sit down and do an interview with me? Bam. Next day, I was on his boat filming one of his fishing trips. He sat down, did an interview. I was so amazed at how open he was and how much I could learn and kind of expose just because I had approached the situation a little bit differently. And that friendship, which was questioned at the time and really ridiculed at the time by other conservationists, eventually led to a level of trust where Mark let me take his kids diving with sharks. So that was a really cool project I did not too long ago, and I think that that is really going to change the future for them. Yeah, and that's a video that everyone can watch online, The Hunter's Son um, featuring Maverick, who you speculated that, you know, this his son may end up taking over the family business one day. Any update on where they're at now? Are they, are they still operating in the same way? Any changes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, their dad's the hero, so there's definitely still – that kind of strong family bond based around killing sharks, but they always have a friend on our side as well now. And I plan on when I can basically find the means to be able to continue to do so. I plan on going back and continuing that relationship with his children and just introducing them more and more to the natural world and knowing that there are other ways to look at sharks than just as something that you can hunt. Excellent. All right. We'll, um, we'll get towards the Indonesian project in a little bit, but, um, Around about that time, what other campaigns were you working on? And I'd love to learn a little bit about some of the campaigns around shark meat and the research that you did for your original um, Shark Girl film around Mm -hmm. the toxicity of shark meat. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, so I've tested shark meat for mercury, arsenic, and selenium in three different countries now, Indonesia, Australia, and America. Indonesia results haven't come back yet. I've done it for the supermarket chains in Australia and America and found in both places more than one sample has come back over the legal limits and over the suggested safe limits of mercury. So I've really been attacking the seafood industry that sells shark and suggests that it's a viable consumer meat because it's really not. One thing I did recently as well was actually take meat from shark fishing tournaments that were occurring in the USA and tested them as well. I only just got the results back from them a couple of days ago and they were incredibly high as well. So it's it's just been a really interesting kind of different way to approach that because people might not care about sharks, but they do care about themselves and their kids and their family. And if they know they're poisoning themselves by eating the shark meat, perhaps they'll look at it a bit differently. So another thing I did was in Australia tested shark meat and other fish samples for genetics to see what species were on the market. And more than half of what we tested was mislabeled and passed off as something else. And a lot of shark gets flooded in the Australian market and called something else. So it was really interesting to see how many infractions occur in the seafood industry, even here in Australia. Um, and that, yeah, that's something that I, I'll always focus on is is attacking it from the consumer side as well. On that of, you know, Australia and shark fishing and the supply chain into supermarkets, fish and chip shops, et cetera, um, where is it at now? Do you know much about the current state? Has community perceptions been shifting as people become more aware of the human health risks associated with eating shark meat? Definitely a small amount of the public have. Um, I think it's so normalised here in Australia, whereas when I did it in Florida and the US, so many people were hostile towards me right away because they were like, we don't sell shark meat here. And then I was like, yes, you do, look. And then everybody was kind of shocked to even realise that it was there. I think it's so normal in Australia that we don't even take a second look at it. So it's slowly kind of changing in the public, but definitely not fast enough because you still have, for example, pregnant mothers out there reading the government's guidelines which say you can eat shark once a fortnight. The levels of mercury that I found in shark meat from Woolworths had a level high enough to cause a spontaneous abortion if eaten by the mother or potentially serious neurological defects on a developing baby in a fetus if eaten by the mother. So we've got a really, really dangerous, crazy consumer product being sold here to the general public and not enough awareness about it and even the government isn't doing enough about it. And any action on the actual shark fishery? I believe it comes under this East Coast fin fish fishery and there's a a quota that was um, stated of some 600 tonnes annually, um, of which, am I right, 80% of that can occur within the confines of the Great Bay Reef Marine Park? Yeah, so the East Coast inshore fin fish fishery was one of the very first things that I targeted as a kid that I really wanted to see end. And I put a lot of attention and time into it and found just how terribly regulated and managed shark fisheries in Australia are, but how common they are. We have several shark fisheries in Australia aimed at different species, and we've had several in the past that have collapsed and never bounced back. So we've already made some mistakes when it comes to fishing sharks, but keep doing it anyway. So, yeah, that that still occurs, and they still operate in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, and there is a huge amount of trade in Australia for shark meat. And then when I was in Hong Kong, you'll see shark fins that are a product of Australia. So we're exporting and we're leaving products here for people to consume. And I definitely think we need more public attention about that. Let's move on to, to shark finning then. Um, admittedly, the, the connection point for you and I in a physical sense came when shooting the documentary Blue and, and for Blue, you did go to one of the, the largest shark markets in Indonesia. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that experience, what you encountered and how that's led to this new body of work? Yeah, so we were in Indonesia about the same time, I believe. I just left and then you were arriving and we were shooting for Blue. Um, it was the first time I'd ever been to Indonesia and I had no desire ever to go because I knew how terrible their fisheries were. I didn't want to support that economy. And it was exactly what I expected. You know, they they brought me to this place to film it was. I really love how authentic the filmmaking of Blue was because that was actually the first time I'd ever seen that and they just followed me around the market with the cameras and it was just hundreds of sharks on that floor, giant bull sharks, makos, tigers, like everything, and it was just such a shocking scene. 
And that was my first introduction. And then I went back like a year later with my dad and saw it again. And I just started thinking at that point, you know, what, what could we possibly do about this? And it seems so sad that Australia has got so many people visiting Indonesia, but so few of them are realizing what's happening there. So that's when I started thinking about other places around the world that had done tourism in places where animals were being fished and the fishermen had ended up moving away from fishing because they had a better income through tourism. And that's where I randomly thought about Project Hiyu and that turned into what it is now. Yeah, Project Hear You. So give us a little bit of a glimpse into what uh, you aim to do with that project, where it's at now and where you see it heading. So Project Hear You literally started with me going back to Indonesia, going up to a fisherman as he was taking dead sharks off his boat to be processed, pretending that I was some kind of excellent surfer and asking him if he knew any secret waves this side of the island and then trying to talk him into renting me his boat for the next week instead of turning around and fishing sharks which he did. And it was an incredibly unlikely friendship. And that same man that I met on that day, a few years later, has a daughter named after me. And he's now the head of the kind of fleet that Project HU employs, which I hope is slowly growing. Um, Project HU operates in that area in Indonesia, the same place we filmed for Blue, to employ shark fishermen and the very boats they use shark fishing. And we use them to engage in tourist activities like diving and surfing and all kinds of fun stuff. And we pay the fishermen a better wage than they would get fishing sharks. And in turn, they stay back. They don't go out to sea fishing. And we get to use their very boats as tourist boats. So I think it's the only kind of situation in the world where a tourist who loves sharks can go interact with a shark hunter's family and pay them to do something else and know that their money is going to helping sharks while they have fun in the ocean. And this really is what I wanted just to spend a moment to send some incredible um, energy your way, Maddie, because the the level of maturity and what you've had to counter in order to establish this project and to make this impact is just remarkable and really worth focusing on. Um, anyone can go online and look at some of that footage of the shark market, which you will, you know, take visitors through that experience. To, to encounter it must obviously for most people be such a heart-wrenching experience yet to turn that on its head completely and then say well just by you being here by changing your lens from pointing the finger and passing blame to acknowledging the complexity and supporting in what little way you can to trigger an entire new tourism industry in these communities it is such an amazing approach to take. Thank you. And I think you just nailed it then when you said acknowledging the complexities. So we look at the shark fin trade as a whole and what part of it we can potentially affect as individuals. And at that point, it's very like, am I going to be angry or am I going to be effective? Like, I don't necessarily want to deal with the men killing sharks, but that's the one part of the trade that I can actually infiltrate as an individual right now. So me personally, I have very little effect on the consumers in China. I have very little effect on the buyers making hundreds of thousands of dollars on shark fin exports every month. But what I can do, what I can infiltrate, what I can help with is the very start of the chain. And that's the men that get exploited to go fish these sharks. So it was a really kind of simple concept. And I still to this day can't believe I flew to Indonesia just to wing it. You know, (laughs) just like I was a 24-year-old Australian female going to a non-tourist part of an intense Muslim country to get shark fishermen to work for me. Like, put that on paper, it does not make sense. And it still ended up being one of the greatest things I've ever done. And it just takes, like, a tiny bit of compassion and belief in yourself and trial and error, I think, to realise just how much of a difference that you can make and all the things that you can do. And the great thing is that you, as a storyteller and filmmaker, you are documenting this journey really, really well. So anyone can, again, go and watch those videos, understand a little bit about you and this strategy, but see the change taking place. And some of the most compelling um, video and audio that you capture is, is this insight into, well, these people don't necessarily want to have a job to feed their family that involves killing sharks. They just want a job to feed their family. Um, yeah. 
how's it sort of going now? Obviously, in this time, it would be taking a hit because no one's traveling. Um, mm mm-hmm. What's the status now and and how are you going to hope to to sort of bounce back? So there's always been things when the fishermen have been fishing that have stopped them from fishing anyway. Weather events, um, the price of petrol, Ramadan, their religious holidays. So they are quite used to going months without work, which is a good thing. At the moment, nobody is fishing sharks. So that's a really, really great breather that we can have, which is probably the only reason that I'm sitting here kind of calm and have time to surf. It's because I'm like, phew, nobody is fishing sharks there right now, you know, big deal. Um, And my particular employees I still stay in touch with, and I have them on a small retainer right now. So I'm basically acting like Centrelink to them. Um, And they are earning money that they know they're going to have to work for in the future. And this is purely because I want them to be able to trust that I'm going to be there for them at these times. And I want the community to be able to trust my involvement and how serious I am about it so that's operating and we still stay in touch and they're okay and they're surviving and the biggest thing for me for them is is safety because they do live on a very small isolated island so I can't be taking tourists there anytime soon so it is going to be quite a long break and delay before we can go back but in turn I've utilized this time to look deeper into their trade and really examine each part of where it goes and hopefully by the time everything's back to normal I can make more developments along the trade in China, in areas of Indonesia. Um, so right now is a really good planning and kind of developing time for what can happen when we are allowed access to them again. Who's here to support you throughout this project? Um, is there a whole team behind you and, and how are you going about funding and obviously use this as an opportunity to, to plug how people can support you and your efforts? Yeah, so um, Project Here is literally started with about nine thousand Australian dollars. Um, that's how much I was able to raise and get from a grant. And you know, two years later, and we've employed six fishing boats, and we're making huge impacts on the village and the trade. Started with such a small amount of funding compared to what most organisations get. Um, you know, there's an organisation there with millions of dollars of funding just to take data on the catch, whereas we're actually preventing the catch from being caught. So it's such a small kind of financial assistance that we had. And right now, a lot of what happens there is public support, so public donations. And then the other thing has always been people booking onto my trips. So the money they're paying is going back into the fishing boats, and that's basically how it's been able to run. Uh, In the future, we're hoping to boost things a lot more. I want to get more boats involved and on board, have them doing things like waste management, which employs them without us having to be there. And the basically the best way for people to support any of that is to go to my website, projecthu.com, buy some merch, donate, become part of the crew, help us to stop it. Eventually, we're going to establish different ways for people to be helped in Indonesia that don't involve joining a trip, like day trips and simple things like that. But for now, really helping with the awareness or with individual skills that people may have, it is, I think, a base team of three. It's me, and then it's my head fisherman in Indonesia that's helping me. And then it's I have a, a young friend who just graduated university with a business mind that helps as well. And he does all that kind of stuff that I'm terrible at because I couldn't even show up on time for this podcast. So you can't imagine me doing all the business side of things. So I've got a little bit of help, but it means a lot. It's really cool to see other people's skills come in and assist with this project. But by no means do I know what I'm doing. <laughs> by no means am I organized. By no means am I brilliant in any way, shape or form. We are just going at it bit by bit. But our motivation and our stamina in this project just continues to grow with the relationships that we develop with the fishermen and right now that means more than any outside support so we're just slowly working at it and building at it hey don't you ever for a second start not acknowledging how brilliant you are it's just you got to acknowledge <laughs> that you're brilliant at certain things and you yes, get other yeah. people to do the areas where you're not exactly yeah business things not yeah <laughs> I'm happy uh, to say I'm not good at that. So what you are brilliant at, as we've spoken a lot about, is obviously this the leadership role, your knowledge, your passion, your ability to tell stories. Let's talk about some of the other uh, issues facing sharks globally or maybe we focus here on Australia um, that you've really been trying to bring awareness to, maybe some that have made 
some positive gains, others that are going nowhere. Um, obviously, we spoke a little bit about sort of shark fishing. Has there been anything that's happened in recent years that has improved the rates of shark fishing? And we can obviously then start to talk about some of the um, culling projects and and uh, and drum lines, etc. Yeah, so I think for me, one of the most frustrating things is still legal commercial shark fisheries in Australia that are still going strong. I think another really frustrating thing is the tournaments in the USA where people recreationally fish sharks. However, there is a lot more pressure on them now. They knew straight away when I was there that I was there to film them in a negative light without even knowing me. So they know people are watching. So that's been a really nice, interesting development. Um, and then, of course, there's the gargantuan task of tackling shark finning, which doesn't seem to be slowing down at all. But the biggest developments we've had on that end are from scientific research. Now that we're able to do things like map genetics and really have a stronger look into the shark fin trade, science is really pushing the way forward when it comes to shark finning. All the research being done in Hong Kong will hopefully help us kind of stricken the trade a lot more with the illegal and legal species coming in. So all that's been really, really interesting. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that I hope comes out of this situation in particular is a highlight on the wildlife trade because the same kind of thing happened when SARS happened and they shut down a few markets in China at that time as well. But then when the world went back to normal, they started up again. So if anything, hopefully the situation helps us shed light on it and to realize that as countries, we can't be allowing any more human life or economy loss to support such a crazy wildlife trade. And shark fins are no doubt part of that. Mm. Back to some of those videos on Project Hiu and members of your team, you've got people that are helping in countries like China to try and, I mean, obviously there's many organisations that are trying to stem the appetite for the product. Has there been much, I know I think that you shared something recently that there was another huge haul just recently, an illegal haul of fin. So any, yeah. any silver linings or glimmers of hope there around stemming the appetite for the product? Um, you know, when I was there, I remember seeing a huge abundance of shark fin. I thought it was kind of like whaling, you know, whaling still happens, but nobody's really eating whale anymore, but it's not the case in China. The shark fins still sell out. There's still high demand. They're still in almost every second household and you're still not worth marrying into unless you can afford shark fins at your wedding. So it's still a really strong cultural thing. I think the next generation is definitely going to change that, which is really hopeful. Um, but I think that they still are a bit scared to speak up against the current generation. And I think that the most hopeful thing that we can see is going to be governments from other countries really putting their foot down and no longer supporting that trade, which I think is slowly happening. I know that um, an organisation known as Shark Conservation Australia is pushing legislation in Parliament in Australia to find out more things about our shark fin contributions and making that public is going to be really interesting because it's one thing to look at China and dislike what they're doing, but it's another thing to recognise that your country contributes to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if changing perceptions in a culture that has you know, a, a long association and huge attraction to this product is, is one thing, then changing perceptions of people's attitudes towards sharks globally is another. And I think we can use this as a bit of a, a prelude to the conversation about um, shark nets and drum lines and mitigation me measures in Australia. Um, mm -hmm. Where are we at currently with that and and is it getting better? Um, what's getting better is our ability to band together, raise awareness and fight against it. Not so much the issue. What's getting better is our knowledge of alternatives and our ways of dealing with sharks. But we still have this old archaic system in place in the meantime. So Australia is still guilty of killing sharks through culls and shark nets. Our population still guilty of being very ignorant when it comes to the real dangers of sharks at the coastline. But I think that there is a huge shift in mentality that is slowly working its way into the general public where I don't know that shark nets would have been featured on the news, I don't know, 20 years ago, but now they're making headlines at prime time and people are seeing graphic footage of dolphins being killed off our coastline. So the fact that media is getting out there more and more is a really amazing thing. I think the revolution for sharks in the media really started with shark water and has continued since then. And I think that that's a big deal as well. Yeah, 
And speaking of media, so there is a project brewing in Australia, a new feature documentary called Envoy Carl, and you were on Sunrise recently talking about that. You want to tell us a little bit about that project and, and, and your involvement? Yeah, I'm really excited for um, that, that project Envoy Carl because it's, it's the first time that people from outside the conservation industry with a background and profession in filmmaking have taken all the work the conservationists have done and put it to a story. And having that outsider kind of opinion on it, creating it, is really going to help us appeal to general public. So it could be a really dangerous thing for Australia to find have finally have all this information at their fingertips. Um, so that's really interesting. My involvement was quite minimal. I just uh, knew the crew, filled them in on a few things, did an interview, gave them some stock footage from the shark nets, which I've been diving on since I was a little kid. And I think the biggest thing was was giving them footage that I had access through a Freedom of Information application. So all this stuff that's happened behind closed doors in Australia is about to become public information with this film, which is pretty exciting. And what is your hope then? So assuming this project hits the mainstream and really helps to change people's understanding and attitude, what would be your hope for the future for this particular, um, you know, issue of preventing, I suppose, human to shark encounters on Australia's coastline? Yeah, so my hope would be quite simple. It's not even to, you know, remove the nets so that animals don't get killed, take out the drum line so that sharks don't get killed. My hope is purely to have a community, a society here in Australia that takes the ocean into their own hands, their responsibility when they go into it and realises that we don't have domain over it and we don't get to control what lives and dies for our own comfort but also just to be a little bit safer to really take responsibility in your own hands for your own sake of personal safety and for people to get that that knowledge that they need and for alternatives effective alternatives things that work better than the shark nets and drum lines to be put in place to protect people at the beaches I personally don't feel safe at all surfing anywhere near a shark net or drum line and I would love to see the huge amounts of taxpayer money that go into them directed to something more effective. That's just such a huge statement, isn't it? Someone who knows sharks' behaviour so well and has so much experience to say that, look, you're trying to make surfers safer. I'm telling you I feel unsafe being near these devices that you're putting all your faith in. Yeah, and, you know, like, (laughs) it's terrible, but, like, surfing in Indonesia is like a little bit comforting because you know how many sharks have been killed locally. <laughs> it's like a terrible thing to say. So even if the nets were effective, I'd, I'd be honest about it, but they're just not. It really adds insult to injury that we're wiping out all this wildlife and it's not even being done effectively. And, I mean, you would have heard of Vic Hislop. I'm sure a lot of your listeners would have heard of Vic Hislop. Famous shark hunter, hates sharks, hates them with a passion. You know, his, his mission in life was to rid sharks from the ocean to keep all the dolphins and whales safe, basically. He's this old school shark hunter that lives in Harvey Bay. And I remember speaking to him about it and he hates the shark nets. He says that they bring sharks closer into shore and they have so much bycatch and that they need to be taken out. So if someone that loves humans and hates sharks is saying that, and I'm saying that, then it's, it's pretty safe bet that they're not the best thing to have in the ocean to protect people. Yeah. One of the things that we're excited about with this new documentary film is the conversation on other solutions and particularly around innovation, which is right in the wheelhouse of what Ocean Impact Organisation is trying to do. How can we innovate? How can we improve the way that we treat planet ocean and give the tools to people who can, you know, build businesses that can help to do things differently? Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the, you know, some hints and tips, I suppose, for surfers, swimmers, divers and sharks. You have got on your website a guide for people to download, a free guide to learn how to be uh, safer around sharks. You want to give us some of those key takeouts and hints and tips? Yeah, so the guide covers quite a few numbers of things. Uh, I think the two most important things in my guide that even I learned from and I was fascinated about reading was environmental factors like rainfall, times of day, water temperature, bait balls, things like that and how they affect sharks, but also the first aid section and 
what to do if a shark attack occurs. Because a lot of the time you could do everything right. You could be at a netted beach. You could be surfing middle of the day, crystal clear water, and you could still potentially be attacked by a shark. So it's really crazy that it's not ingrained in us from a young age in Australia exactly how to handle these situations first aid wise, because that's going to be the difference between life and death. So my favorite thing about the surfing guide is not only that it doesn't lie about the potential dangers of sharks, but it also addresses what to happen if if that's the case, if that's going to happen, how to prepare yourself, how to react to that shark in the water. And I think all that stuff's really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. What's it like? Um, you know, obviously you've got such a, a steely resolve when it comes to your passion and your commitment is, is you know, evident that it's going to be there for a long time to come. But how are you going now when you go into some of those shark markets and encounter these these you know these animals that you love so so dearly and to see them in such a horrific state um I have been filming dead sharks. I think the first time I was fifteen when I saw like a I got into a truck in Mexico, like a big truck, and the truck was filled to the roof with dead sharks, and the fishermen were encouraging me to crawl on them and film them, and I did, and there was just blood up to my shins and that was the first time I did that and I completely broke down after that and it affected me for a long time and now I'm just at the point where I think I'm so desensitized to it in order to be effective that I just don't even notice it anymore and I think that that's also a coping mechanism for me the fact that you have to kind of act like you don't mind that sharks are being killed in order to film in places like that that really helps when you're in there. So you almost have to put on this persona and you have to be an actress to get through it. So that helps me cope with it. It's something I'm just so used to. And I just, if I ever have trouble with it, it's just this mentality in my brain where I just think to myself, you're going to be far more effective if you just show that this doesn't affect you right now or you don't let it affect you than if you did let it affect you. So I always just bring it back to myself being selfish I'm like do you want to save sharks or do you want to be selfish right now so I guess giving myself a little inner monologue pep talks is how I deal with situations like that and I guess also having to do that now with guests who you take into this experience as well which um mm -hmm. I imagine you've obviously developed all those mechanisms but to then give your visitors a pep talk and say hey this is how you're going to need to behave in this setting how does that work out um I mean, I guess I'm pretty scary because all my guests that do like end up crying always hide from me when they do so. Um, it's yeah, it's amazing. So people that book on my trips, there's always a day where I take them to the market and they're gonna see a giant hammerhead having its head chopped open in front of them and it's quite graphic and it's very confronting and I am very aware of the emotional effect it has on them, but I'm also very aware of how inspiring and passion driving it can be for them. So I guess I'm just thinking of the benefits. It's very, very hard to fight against something that you haven't been exposed to. It gives them credibility when they're talking about the issues with their loved ones to have seen it. And then they spend the rest of the week on a boat that would be bringing back the same number of sharks if it wasn't for them. So if anything, it just heightens their passion for future involvement in conservation. And although they do get affected and they do get emotional, I'm there for them throughout the whole process to answer any questions that they have. And I think it really, really sets a foundation for them to be further involved in conservation. So it, it, it's a way off for them, but I think it comes out that it's, it's worth it. Yeah. And once again, just that, that level of resolve and maturity that you show in order to see the end game is just, it's not worth glossing over at all. Um, it really is just truly remarkable. So if Project HIU succeeds, um, what does success look like for it? What, what does success look like for you in your efforts for conservation? How can what you do spearhead many others to do what they can to, to make a positive impact? I think one of the things that have gotten me through so far is not having goals um, and just honestly playing it by ear because I never want to let myself down. And you have to celebrate every tiny little victory in conservation. It could go one of many ways. I could potentially establish such an amazing tourist site that attracts so much attention that we could put half, if not all, of the fleet out of fishing and have them engaged in tourism. That would be very possible if I had the right amount of tourists come because that's what the fishermen want. Uh, the other thing is that the margins on the people who buy the shark fins are so high that they could just start offering my fishermen more money for the shark fins and they could just go, no, we don't want to do tourism, we're going to go back to fishing sharks. 
even that's a win in my mind because I've made it that much harder for them to get shark fins and have to put their price up. So no matter which way it goes, it has the potential of doing good. Even if I continue on the track I'm on now and I've only managed to hire six out of the 52 of the fishing fleet on that particular island and make the tiniest dent, I've still shown them the possibility of tourism and introduced it to them. And I know that eventually that's going to be non-optional for them because the decline in shark species in the area. So if anything, we've just kind of shown them a glimpse of what they can do and now they have enough confidence in themselves knowing that they can do it that they might take it into their own hands and honestly i think at the end of the day it's not going to be me that changes this area i think it's going to be the fishermen all i do right now is facilitate their growth and i think that a lot of people say oh it's amazing you're educating shark fishermen and that's not true at all it's them that are educating me it's them that are just allowing me to bring them what they need in order for them to make the changes themselves they have truly been the masters of their own destiny in this project, and I would love to see them have the resources to continue doing tourism and never look back and never go back to fishing again. Well, Maddie, we are just so fortunate um, to have you, and we just wish you so much um, success in whatever shape and form it takes for you in the future and however you want to interpret that. I'm going to give you a chance to sort of wrap up the conversation Anything that you wanted to speak about today that we haven't spoken about, obviously give people um, you know, access to all the sources where they can go and, and take a deeper dive into, into your work, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, um, I would just encourage people to watch the films about Project Hiu that you can see on Vimeo, YouTube or my Instagram. I'd encourage people to follow the Project Hiu page and to join me on a trip. No matter who you are, what you do, come join me on a trip and, and witness it firsthand. Anybody that has any ideas about how we can propel this project into the future and make it better would be amazing. And basically to just start local with an issue that you know you can tackle, that's what I did and this is where I've ended up. So never underestimate the power of an individual and for by all means um, utilise people like myself when you have questions about conservation, just come to me and I'll help any way I can. And, yeah, just know your power as an individual please help Project Here because we need all the help we can get and stay updated. And if anybody's interested in the shark fin side of things and how this trade develops when it goes from the fishermen all the way to China, stay updated with our work because that's something that I'm focusing on filming and exposing this year. Awesome. Well, Maddie, it's pretty easy to find online. She gave you a few links there before. Obviously, if you're catching this um there'll be some notes as well where you can follow the trail um maddie just thank you again so much for all that you do um so so stoked to see you in this time strategizing planning your next maneuvers and i just wish you all the best thank you and to you too and thank you for letting me speak about my little project on your podcast <laughs> all right legend see ya bye
Yeah.